is what I call accent lighting. This is basically lighting that adds little hints of light and so on in different areas of your subject. Some people call some of this approach kicker lighting and so on like that. I tend to lump it all into one particular category called accent lighting. Again, little bits of light added to your subject to bring out detail and so on. Now, I've already talked about the hair light, but I'm going to talk about it again just a little tiny bit here. Adding a hair light to your subject is really a matter of taste or not. And it depends on, of course, who you're photographing and so on. If I'm photographing somebody with dark hair against a dark background, a hair light is very helpful. But if I'm photographing, say, a person with blonde hair against a white background, there's absolutely no reason for a hair light. They can often be the difference between making the subject stand out or pop off the background and so it's up to you as to whether you want to add one or not. I personally think in many situations they make the subject look a lot better, they make the portrait look more professional and it's a nice subtle detail that just when mixed with all your other lighting strategies really makes for a great portrait. First of all the hair light can be a little bit difficult to set up. I basically put mine on a lighting boom above the subject and behind them. And this basically means that you've got to keep going back, readjusting or fine-tuning the position of the hair light to hit only the part of the head that you want. And so that means take a picture, go back, turn the cranks on your boom, which, by the way, a boom that actually has adjustments, the hand cranks, to tilt the light up, tilt the light down, tilt the light left or right, is a huge advantage over a non-adjustable lighting boom that requires you to take the boom down every time. You could spend a lot of time trying to fine-tune that. So I prefer to use grids, but also a snoot is very, very helpful for getting a hair light very fine-tuned into a spotlight to hit the top of the head. So here's an example we've seen in this course already. There's a beautiful little accent to the top of her head. Now you can see kind of a hot spot there for the most part. And then it's very subtle to the left and to the right of that hot spot there. Now I'm, when I say hot, usually that means blown out. This is not hot. This is a perfect hair light exposure. But again, she's dark haired against a dark background and it really helps separate her from the background. So, whether to use a hair light or not is a personal decision, and it's going to depend on your subject. I recommend that you practice, really get the technique down a lot, and then decide on an individual basis whether it's appropriate for the subject you're about to photograph. The next light I use, which a lot of people call kickers, is an edge light. An edge light can be kind of like a hair light, where it adds an edge of light not only to the head, but the back of the head, top of the shoulders, and the arms. You can set up an edge light to be either a hard edge light, like this example here. If you look at the neck, it's really a harsh sort of edge there, and that's because it was created with a grid. You can also set up an edge light using a light box if you're doing, say, a half body length, or you could do it for this picture as well, but it works really well for half bodies and even full lengths. And if you're going to do a full length edge light on somebody, just make sure that you're doing it with a light source that's big enough to do it. And in this case, I often use my extra large light box if I'm doing an edge light on somebody that's going to be more full length. But again, you can use a grid for a harder edge light, or you can use a light box for a softer edge light. In this particular example, the edge light is roughly 10 to 10.30 o'clock on the lighting clock. And basically, it's pretty harsh. But I like it. It works good. It's not necessary because he's not super dark haired and he's got a light colored shirt on, but it does help a lot. Here's another example of photographing an athlete in the studio where I used an edge light again at about 10 o'clock. Notice the nice highlight on her arm and as well as on her nose. This is really making the physique stand out. And that's what this shoot was all about. It was uh, basically a, a photograph that wanted to emphasize her physique with the concept being aerobic conditioning. And the way this was lit was the key light is at about 4 o'clock, a large white umbrella at a lower power setting, making it not the dominant light source, than a light box at 10 o'clock, which is 
much brighter than the key light. So I guess in a way you could call the kicker light or the edge light at 10 o'clock more of the key light than the umbrella, being more of a fill. And then there was also one more light box at about 1.30 as also a fill light to keep the backside of her from going too dark. In this example of these gentlemen at full length, there is a light box at about 10 o'clock again that is putting that highlight on the arm of the gentleman on the left and it's adding a little detail to his shoulder. A little bit hard to see in the printed example of the photograph but this absolutely was the type of photograph that required a edge light coming from the left side to keep their dark clothing from merging with the background. So perfect example of needing a edge light here. Now here's an excellent example of what I'm talking about. This is a studio portrait with the company products. A little bit different than your traditional portraiture, but if you're a studio portrait photographer, you might get asked to photograph this type of stuff. It's just a wall in the background that's been painted dark gray so that it is dark. And this is a studio wall that we paint different colors all the time. And then some blinds uh, hanging from stands with a uh, umbrella back there to create that glow through the blinds. But look at his shoulder and the side of his head. This is a superb example of creating an edge light to keep the subject separating from the background. And again, the kicker light here, or the edge light, is about 1030. Now here's an example on location. And I will admit, I find myself doing edge lighting a lot more on location than I do in the studio. But here's an example of uh, an edge light coming from about 2 o'clock this was uh, a CEO of a company photographed for Electronic Business Magazine. And you can see the side of his face. The kicker is keeping that sort of nicely highlighted, but also on the shoulder and the back of his arm. Now here's an interesting portrait that, I, that I'm very happy about when I took this. The woman's got beautiful tattoos, and I really wanted to emphasize those. I've got a black background behind her, and you can look at the diagram. Two large light boxes, one on her face, one on the background, at separate levels. And I'll zoom in here a little bit, but you can see that there's just a nice little highlight on the back of her very black hair, creating that separation. I cannot stand dark hair merging with dark backgrounds. There has to be some separation. And this worked very well. Now here's another example, and I'll admit this was very early in my career, photographing in a gym. And this is a, a technique that you see a lot with photographing sports figures. There's two umbrellas, one on the left at about 10 o'clock, one on the right at about 2 o'clock, putting nice edges on her arms. If you look at the uh, top of her arm and then the bottom of her arm, especially on the right side, and then, of course, the sides of her head. This is a very popular technique for photographing athletes or wanting to show muscles and that sort of thing. And in this case, as I mentioned, this was a little early in my career. It's a little too hot on her cheeks, and I wouldn't ever do that again today. But that means it was in the film days where we couldn't really preview our photography. But it's a good example of photographing an athlete using that type of approach. And then I got one more image here that is definitely an edge light, but a totally different one. Look at the shoulders. This was photographed for an advertisement, again, in the studio. Look at the top of the shoulders. There's a nice, even highlight going across both sides. And in this case, rather than a hair light, because I wasn't going to see the head, I've got a large light box above this model. And that light box is creating light that goes all the way from the left to the right. And it works very well. And then large light box in the front with a fill card on the right side created this particular image. Okay, I want to mention one more thing here, and it's about photographing groups of people and using the technique of feathering your light. If you think about it, if you put a large light box on the left side of a group, it's going to light the person on the left side more than the person on the right side. So there's a strategy for getting a light off to the side of the camera that will light everybody pretty evenly. You could, of course, use on-camera flash, but how ugly is that? That's not portrait photography. That's flash photography. If you use the flash on the camera, then everybody's getting lit equally. But again, we don't want to do that. We want to create shape to our lighting. We just want it to light everybody equally. So if you look at this diagram, here's what I just described. The person on the left is closer to the light than the person on the right. And they're going to be much brighter than the person on the right. Remember the inverse square law? 
basically the person on the right side, if it's double the distance from the light, is only going to get 25% of the light. So to fix this problem, there's, a no, there's one thing in particular you can do. It's back your light up and then also move it closer to the camera. If you look at this diagram, I've backed the light up so that it's really about the same distance from the person on the left and the person on the right. And that's going to make them a lot more even. And you can see that in this example here, which uses only a key light with no fill light. Now, another thing to keep in mind, if you move that light further back, and that's the case of this picture here, the people, uh, the lighting is going to be a little contrast here based on the size of the light source versus the size of the subject, or as they say, in relation to the subject. So the key is to get a much larger light box and then move it way back so the person on the left and the person on the right are getting the same amount of light, but that larger light source is going to create a much softer light. These are so crucial to the success of your portrait. So we're going to look at a few different techniques on how to light them in various ways to really support your subject and make your subject stand out. In the studio, we really have a lot of control over our backgrounds and how they look as far as how bright they are, how dark they are, where the light come from, which areas of the background are lit, which are not, and so on. So if you look at this first portrait here, we have some nice lighting on her face. This is one light at this particular time. But again, the hair and the side of her face is pretty dark. And most of this is due to the dark background. Dark backgrounds are pretty popular, uh, especially like with my students in my online courses. They really like to use black backgrounds. But what's so important is making sure that hair like she has here doesn't merge with the background and you end up with a face basically floating in space. I myself find I don't really photograph people against black backgrounds very often. I've been asked to do it a few times and that's not a problem, but it does create some challenges that are sometimes hard to overcome. One of the first of those is if you're going to create a black background and you want to add light to it to not make it quite so dark, so in a case of this image here, the head stands out a little bit from the background, I don't recommend that you go buy a roll of black paper or hang a black sheet up. Instead, get a dark gray background and then don't put any light on it or add a little bit of light to make it dark gray instead of black. That's the first approach to black backgrounds, especially if you're going to need some separation there. The other approach to black backgrounds is to add light to the subject. We've already talked about um, edge lights and hair lights and so on, and that's a perfect way to sort of light the subject from behind against black and not have any problems with separation. Now, in this case, we have a fully lit portrait with a key and fill light, a hair light, and a background light. And it so happens that this photograph is the same setup as the previous photograph with the black background, except we've added light to the background to keep it from going black. She's now separated from the background quite nicely. So this now is a perfect example of taking control of your lighting, and in particular, the lighting of your background. She's not a face floating against black, and the background does not compete with her. It supports her. She stands out from the background quite nicely. Now here are two of the backgrounds I use the most. On the left is this textured model background that I use a lot, or that I've shown a lot in this course so far. It's got dark patches and light patches and so on, and it's been very popular with my clients. I use these two mostly for business portraits. And on the right is a seamless paper uh, that's actually a very middle gray, and I've got it lit from the bottom with a background light, so it's a light tone graduating through gray tones to a very dark gray, and this works very well as, as well. Here's another uh, example of a blue background, which I'm photographing myself in front of when I was uh, creating a uh, course on flash and using that as a background behind me. This in the studio would be lit much more effectively with dark areas and light areas to show some of the texture and that sort of thing. But uh, this uh, blue background was purchased for a client, so it, well, it matched their corporate colors, which is why they wanted it. I love the background, but it's not very popular with my clients. They really prefer to stand out against neutral colors. But in the end, my clients, especially in the corporate and business world, always pick this background preferably because of its neutral tones. Now here's a background I absolutely love, and it is naturally lighter in the middle and darker in the outside edges. It comes that way. 
I think it's perfect for young adults like this lady, as well as high school seniors and that sort of thing, but I've never really had any business people ask me to use this background. And I often present my options to them and let them decide which background they like the best. And uh, I always show them with people in front of them as well, so they can kind of get an idea how that background fits around the particular subject. Now here's the next thing I do with my backgrounds. This is a businessman in front of that mottled gray background. And notice that the background is out of focus. I think this is another factor in creating great portraits and making sure your background doesn't compete with them. We don't like to look at out of focus stuff. So even with this background being out of focus, it forces us to look more at the person in the portrait. So what I do is I try to keep the subject at least six to eight feet away from the background. I shoot at about 80 to 100 millimeters on my lens and I use f11 and I focus on the eyes. And this almost always makes the background go out of focus and it creates a great look just like this. But again, it's that distance of the subject from the background, which has been mentioned in this course as well. I try to keep them as far away from the background as I can possibly get them in order to get a good background uh, effect. And in this case, again, six to eight feet, even 10 feet would be wonderful. Now here is the seamless paper background and a businessman in front of it. And notice, first of all, that there's no texture in the background that you have to worry about being out of focus. And so that's really important as well. I will go on location to clients' offices and set up in a conference room or something like that at their request. And I don't have as much room as I have in the studio. So I prefer this approach because I can get the person a lot closer to the background and still light it effectively and not have to worry about the background being in focus at all. Now let's talk about lighting the backgrounds. Here's that same background that that previous gentleman was photographed in front of. And you'll notice that you can see the top of my light at the very bottom of the frame here. And what I do is I set the light with a raw reflector on it, or a silver reflector, on a floor stand and put it anywhere from about 15 to 30 inches above the floor. And this is all based on how tall the subject is. And I just do a bunch of testing until I get the gradation just right. You're going to have the head towards the top of the picture and the shoulders about mid to two-thirds up in the picture and the idea is to create that nice glow right above the shoulders as you can see right here in this uh, same photograph of that businessman. The strategy here is to get a nice gradation that comes above the shoulders, not an abrupt line where light meets dark, but rather smooth gradation of gray tones progressing from light at the lower areas to dark at the upper areas. And so this is going to take some experimentation, not only with the height, but also with the distance that the light is from the background and how bright you have it. So that's going to take a little bit of strategy. And I always recommend that you practice this and make note, like your light is uh, 24 inches above the floor and three feet from the background, pointed straight at the background, gives you perfect gradation. Then you know when you go to do this, you can set it up quickly and not have to do a lot of experimenting. Now another thing I'll point out here with this portrait real quick is notice the hair is very close to merging with the background. So this is a perfect candidate for a hair light. Okay, here's the diagram showing the light hitting the background as well as the guy in position and the key light and the fill cart and so on. Now we're back to this businessman and notice the background here. It is not lit from below and graduating up. It's lit from the left and graduating from the right. Now the number one thing about this background strategy is notice the key light is on the right side, lighting his face. So the right side of his face in the picture from our perspective is brighter while the left side of his face and head is darker. So the key here is for the background to be darker behind the lighter side of his face and lighter against the darker side of his face. And so that's the strategy here. Now the strategy in this case is to use a light box as your background light rather than a strobe with a raw reflector. And the reason is we want a bigger light source lighting the background rather than creating a circle glow like the previous example with the seamless paper. We want a, the whole left side of the background to be illuminated and slowly graduate across to the darker side. And so you need a bigger light source to do that. And that's why, as shown here in the uh, lighting diagram, is why we have a light box aimed at the background to create that gradation. Now here's another example of using this exact same lighting approach to the background, but this time I'm doing it with seamless paper. Behind her is a blue background, and the light is coming from the left, 
and slowly graduating across. It's not very abrupt here like it is when I put the light behind the subject and create that glow above their shoulders. Here it's very, very subtle. But again, you can create as much gradation range, in other words, how bright the left side is and how dark the right side is, by increasing the power and feathering the light back and forth to create either a stronger gradation from left to right or a weaker gradation from left to right. And I would call this pretty weak. Now here we have a half portrait and the woman is in front of a different type of a background and again using exactly the same approach. The highlight side of her face is against the darker side of the background and the shadow side of her face is against the lighter side of the background. And the technique again is to put that light box back there, move it back and forth until you get just the right amount of gradation. Now here's another background for a horizontal portrait and this is a test shot. This is one of the photos I take when I'm fine tuning all the lighting and there's problems with the background. First of all, it's too in focus and that large wrinkle on the right side and creating a shadow doesn't really work. So we need to go in and smooth it out and I did that and then I basically switched to vertical photographs and that area where the wrinkle was is basically out of the picture now. Now here's the same setup where we turned off the background light just to see if any of the key light was hitting the background and going to be satisfactory. But of course it's not. It's too dark. There's too much contrast here. And so the goal is to basically find the happy medium between the previous image which was too bright and this image which is too dark. And here I went between the two exposures for the background. The one where it was too bright and the previous one where it was too dark to try to find a happy medium and make it just right. And I even added a little bit of vignetting to it. In some situations you're going to find yourself photographing people or a group of people where the client wants him standing on the background. I was photographing this young man in the studio and basically asked him how he wanted to pose and he said, can I stand on that crate? And his mother said, no, you can't stand on the crate, but you can put your foot on it. And so I basically let them do that kind of stuff. I do find the crate to be uh, really pretty distracting and I should have come up with something else for him, but this is what he wanted and his mom was okay with it. But the reason I'm really showing this is to also be careful when you are photographing somebody standing on a background, they're going to cast a shadow. You see the shadow right here? You basically don't want the shadow of the person you're photographing to fall behind them on the background. That's very distracting and you know, in my opinion, it looks pretty unprofessional. The way you make sure that doesn't happen is you get them further from the background so the shadow falls off to the side. Here it's pretty much fallen off to the side, although I think there's a little bit of it right here. So that's number one. If you can't pull them further from the background to make the shadow go off the side, you have to push your key light towards the background a little bit, which is going to swing that shadow around to the left a little bit, or I should say towards the direction of the camera and out of the frame and off the background. So that's very important. Watch those shadows. Another thing to point out that's really important, and this goes back to when I was talking about knockout backgrounds. When you have somebody standing on the background, it is of course virtually impossible to light the background separately from the subject. The light that's hitting the subject oftentimes is hitting the background. Now you can use cutter cards, and I showed those earlier as well, where you can block some of the light from hitting the background, but it's not really that easy to get a separately lit look to your background, meaning lit with other lights that are not hitting your subject. Most of the time, the light hitting the subject is going to hit your background. Now here's an example of this uh, businessman sitting in the chair using that tilt shift effect. And what I ended up doing is you can see the shadow first of all on the left side of him. And what I ended up doing was going in and creating a vignette that sort of blended it all together and made that shadow not so strong that's down on the floor. Now here's a cowboy in the studio, foot on a bale of hay. The background is receiving the sa same light that's hitting him. So in this case what I did is I take it into Photoshop and I convert it to black and white and I really make him stand out as far as tonal values. Like his face is pretty bright as well as his hand and then his chest comes along accordingly as far as the clothing is concerned. But then I go in and I add that vignette and I darken all the corners around him and then that really makes the background more of a supporting part of this overall photograph making him look really great and I did this in processing because I couldn't do it in lighting. And then finally I'm going to show you one more approach to a background. This happens to be the vertical blind in front of large windows used as a background behind all these people in a business office. But this is fake. I went and bought these vertical blinds 
and then I suspend a metal pole between two light stands and I clamp the vertical blinds to it and raise it up. And now we have a simulated office background. And I have a large light box on the left and basically there's an umbrella aimed straight to the left that's creating that glow in the blinds as if the sunlight is coming through. And it works perfectly. In addition, you can have this way behind the people uh, at a good distance and your key light and fill light will not hit them as far as the blinds and won't add light to the blinds. They might be getting a little bit from the key light, but it doesn't look like a background behind somebody that you're trying to light separately. And so this works really well. So when it comes to backgrounds like anything else in photography, your imagination is what matters. And if you have an idea for a photograph, or you got a client come in and say, well, we want to create an office look, but we don't have an office for you to shoot in, because we're a virtual online agency, then you can set up and fake an office here with vertical blinds. So there you go. There's a few strategies on basically lighting backgrounds. Enjoy. Hi, and what we're going to do is take a quick look at managing studio backgrounds. A good background is crucial to a successful portrait in studio photography. So it's really important to choose one that doesn't conflict with your subject, but rather supports them and, and helps them stand out from the background. So we're going to take a look at a couple different options here. In this next picture here, this is obviously not a studio portrait, but a location portrait. Here, you really have no control over much of anything. You go in and you try to find the best possible background that you can for this type of subject, but she's lit by the window light, and here, framed in tightly so that there's no real distractions in the background behind her. In this next picture here, of course, we're in a restaurant. This is a wonderful portrait and I shot this for a magazine. And the background tells the story here. And that's what's important about this type of a portrait. It's an environmental portrait. It's important to the overall story that the magazine really wants to tell about this restaurant. But in the studio, we tend to have way more options and way more control over how we use our backgrounds here. So in this particular picture here, you can see that she's got nice lighting on her face, but we are kind of dark over in this area here. And um, the dark background, which is really, really popular with a lot of photographers, especially a lot of my students who have taken my workshops and, and my other online classes, they like black backgrounds. But look at the problem this creates. Her dark hair is blending in with the dark background, and in particular on the left side of the picture here. And this is the type of thing that you need to master as far as control. You need to prevent that from happening. And honestly, I don't shoot black backgrounds hardly ever, and this is one of the reasons. But very few people actually want to be featured against the black background. And it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It doesn't mean I haven't done it. But there's a lot more issues that, ha that take place with a black background. So here's another example of a background and this is the same background as previously shown. However, there was no light on the background like there is here. There was no hair light, there was no fill light. We only had the key light hitting this side of her face. So the fact that we just added more lights separated her nicely from the background. So this is point number one about taking control of your lighting to make your background support your subject. Here it does not distract from her, it does not conflict, it looks quite nice. Now, to give you an idea of a couple different types of backgrounds, here's two of them that I use extensively. This background here is a painted canvas, and this is, without a doubt, what I shoot 99% of my portraits against. It's got a texture to it when it's behind a subject. It's very, very nice, supports them wonderfully, and it just gives a pleasing appearance. Now, the one on the right is a seamless paper background that you can buy in a roll. And this one happens to be a gray one that's been lit. And you can see that there's a difference. There's no texture in the background on the right. And there's going to be times when that's exactly what you want. And here is another background. And actually, it's a picture of myself getting ready to uh, shoot a video for my flash class. And I have this blue background that a client asked me to buy. They wanted all their executives photographed in front of it years ago and the blue color matched their logo and that's why they wanted to do that. Well, nobody else really wants this background behind them. I think it's wonderful, but it's just so eye-popping and so on that most people don't want it as a background because it really conflicts with them. Neutral backgrounds are more popular when you're dealing with business and industry. 
like I mentioned just a few seconds ago, this is background is the one that's the most popular that I use a lot. And it's actually been hand painted. You can still buy these all over the place. And uh, you can flip it upside down to have these darker tonal areas be at the top, or I'm sorry, at the bottom. And you know, you can pretty pretty well use it for just about anything you want. I've shot products on it, I've shot people in front of it, and it's just plain a nice background. And I believe the number one appeal is because it's neutral, it's gray, it's not going to compete with the subject. Now here's a beautiful background and I really like this background a lot and this is perfect for young adults, teenagers, senior portraits, that sort of thing. I don't know that I've found a businessman that wants to be photographed in this type of a background because it's bright and it's poppy and it would conflict with them a little bit. It's designed more for I think senior portraits than anything else. The businessmen prefer this background over the this one any day. Now here's kind of an interesting thing that I did many many years ago. This is a wall in my studio. There's also a wall over here that goes that there's a corner back here and the wall goes to the right. That wall we always kept painted white. This one we created a texture by painting it gray and then splotching on with a sponge various tones of gray, darker, lighter to create this sort of textured type of a background. The nice part about doing this in our studio was it was always there. We never had to set anything up. We could just move somebody over in front of it, shoot away, and be done. And it was a deep studio, so we could get way back from it and throw it way out of back, way out of focus due to depth of field concerns. Now here's a businessman in front of that gray background that I told you is so popular. Here he's the background is out of focus. One thing I believe is important it, with a background like this is that it is out of focus and not sharp like your subject. That way it doesn't compete with them in a lot of ways. When it's out of focus, viewers of the picture don't want to look at it. They want to look at the person in front because they're sharp and they're in focus. So I think throwing your background out of focus is crucial in a business portrait like this or in many portraits. The way you do that is you want to get your subject at least 10 feet away from the background. You need to have that much room wherever you're shooting. A lot of times if you're in a living room, you don't have that much room. But that's kind of important to success in getting this type of a picture to work is get them away from the background so the depth of field makes it fall out of focus. I'm at about f11 focus on his eyes and that's keeping him pretty sharp back here but letting the background go out of focus for a very nice look. So here's another business portrait. If I have a client that doesn't care which background I use and I don't have the room that 10 feet I was just describing in depth, I will use the seamless paper because it has no texture so it never looks like it's in focus. And so that's one of the reasons I'll use that gray paper. I also light it differently to get a glow over the shoulders. But if I don't have that depth and use that canvas background and it was going to be in focus, I'll switch to this instead. Now for lighting these, you can just barely see down here the top of my light. It's creating a hot glow here, but where the shoulders are up here, it's falling off at a much more gradual pace, creating that nice glow that you get above the shoulders. This is a popular way to go. The only thing you need to be careful of is hair merging with the background, and this is a situation where a hair light or just lightening up the background a little bit is going to help prevent that. But that's how you light this background. Here's the lighting diagram. There's the background. There is the light pointed at it, and that is what really helps uh, create that glow above the shoulders, a very popular look. Now back to this guy. Notice that the background is lighter on the left side than it is on the right side, and this is due to the way that it's set up. Here we have the background hanging, but we're using a light box to create a more gradual spread from the left side to the right side, making the left side of the background brighter than the right side. This as well is a crucial um, way to, to do this. You want the light to not be even. You want it to be brighter on one side, darker on the other side, and gradate from left to right. Here's another example of using that same lighting technique left to right, but using a blue paper with very, very gradual tonal change from the left to the right. And the hair separates from the background very nicely. Here's the same technique again. The light box is on the left side and it falls off into darkness on the right side. But I want you to notice something here that's crucial. Notice where the key light's coming from. It's right up here. This side of her face is brighter than this side. That's done on purpose. 
if you're going to light your background like this, you want the brighter side of the subject to be against the darker side of the background. You want the darker side of the subject against the brighter side of the background. And that's what makes this technique to background lighting work so well. Here's another background setup that's not lit very well. You can kind of see the corner. And this really is just a test shot to show you. All these wrinkles are kind of distracting. It, it's another way in which the background is lit broadly and doesn't support the subject that well. So here again is the shot. Got rid of the wrinkles, straightened it out, zoomed in on her, and the background is now out of focus very nicely. But when I turn off the background light, I get a whole different effect. Now she's standing out against a dark background with a little bit of detail. The point here is that you can control the background brightness by darkening or lightening, or I should say increasing or decreasing the power on that background light to create the perfect balance of brightness for that background, which supports your subject nicely. Now let's take a look at standing on the background and some of the challenges that go along with that. This was shot many, many years ago, and these kids are all going to be on the cover of a magazine. And the only reason they're really even shot on this background at full length is because the client's going to go in and cut them out, which we call the knockout, and lay them on uh, in the layout. So they won't have this gray background behind them. It would be knocked out and be a lot uh, brighter or whiter as far as the background. But this is the setup. Large, large light stars over here on the right to light the whole group. This is a panel to bounce fill light into the side to keep the side of them from going too dark. Now here's another example of standing on the background. When your subject stands on the background, it's very difficult to light them separately from the background as I've shown in previous examples where I was just saying you can darken the background by cutting the power on the light that's back there. Here, that's much more difficult to do. And I tend to go with a much softer light quality that brightens up the subject but lets the background really fall off uh, into a slightly darker tone. So this is darker here than it is here. And uh, that works pretty well. Another kid, he said, hey, I want to put my foot up on a box and I I said, okay. So he puts his foot up on a box, and this is a nice, subtle background, works very well. The key light's over here. There's a fill panel right here to keep the sh shadow side of his face from going dark. If you're going to do this type of setup, be very, very careful about letting the shadow from the subject cast on the background. You don't want that shadow right back here. So you have to move your key light back, forcing that shadow to go out of the picture. Very important. Here's another example of uh, using a background, and uh, here's that shadow I'm kind of talking about, but we don't find it near as distracting because it's a dark background, it's black and white, and we're kind of going for a lot of creativity. As you can see, we used the tilt shift lens, and that worked very well also in creating a nice effect. Then it was cropped later, because you can, as you can see, we can see off the edge of the background. And then here is a cowboy in the studio. He's got nice lighting on him, but the background is also lit by the same light that's on him. In this case, I go into Photoshop and I do this and really darken it up with a vignette, create that black and white old time look, and that makes the background become less uh, or less stand out or less distracting, makes him pop out much better from the picture. Okay, now we're going to take a look at knockout backgrounds, which are also white backgrounds. Knocking out means just trying to get rid of the background. These are kind of challenging to do because you need to get your subject far enough away from the background that you can light it separately to make sure it goes to white. The brightness level on the subject here, let's say F11 is, is what we're set at, and it's perfect. The brightness back here needs to be F22. Otherwise, the background just ends up being gray. So you need more light on the background than you do on the subject to get it to go white instead of gray. Here is the original shot. Not bad, but she's close enough to it to avoid what we call wraparound, which I'll show you here shortly, is the background ends up being gray, and we have to make it white in Photoshop. But if you can get your subject far enough away from the background, you can really blast it with light and make it a lot whiter. Here's an example. Here's an example, actually, where there's too much brightness on the background, and we're getting what's called wraparound, starting to flare around the edges. And the shadows actually have sort of a blue cast in them. And that's from literally overexposure, but in, in this case, it's overlighting the background and making it blast the subject. So 
this is much more normal. So you don't have the blueness, you don't have the blown out edges and that sort of thing. So when you have this, it tells you you've got too much light on the background. So you need to cut the power on those background lights or try and move your subject even further from the background so some of that light that's coming from the light hitting the background isn't bouncing out and hitting your subject and causing the same thing, this flare. Very important to getting a white background to work right. Just another example, actually on assignment, you can kind of see some edges before the Photoshop work's been done. And um, the background is pretty white, but there's still some gray up here. So I'll go into Photoshop and I'll get rid of all that white with just some retouching. And here's another example of where you don't want a white background, but you do want to create a knockout background. The client's going to go in and knock him out, which also means cut them out from the background and paste them into a layout so he's sitting against white. But because he had such a bright shirt, we found that trying to light the background, there was too much uh, similarity in tonal value, meaning this shirt was too close to the same tone as the, as the background. So we got rid of the background light and just went to uh, let it go gray so that it'd be easy to cut him out. And then one more picture here that is kind of fun. Uh, going in and working at an office and shooting a group shot is always a challenge when there's a giant uh, table in the boardroom and that sort of thing. So I set this up in the studio and I mentioned that white wall earlier. And the way we do this is that we, we uh, basically set these vertical blinds up, clamp them to a pole, hang them between two light stands, have them about 10 feet from the wall, and then I bounce a strobe off the wall that's behind these blinds, and then I light from the left side with a giant umbrella and a fill light, and it looks like they're in the office, but in the studio, I have way more control to make it work just right than I do if I had gone out and done it on location. So there you go. There's some ideas on how to control your backgrounds and manage them, and uh, have fun. Point. You're probably going to be asked to photograph somebody against white, and they're going to want, really, a pure white background. This could be all kinds of different reasons, from photographing a person who's going to be knocked out, placed in a brochure or an advertisement, or simply somebody that just wants to have a white background behind them rather than any other color, and they want it to be pure white. Now, I want to start off by saying right off the bat, you cannot get a pure white background when your subject is standing on it or when your subject's even very close to it. The background must be lit separately and it needs to be lit brighter than your actual subject for it to be pure white. And if you don't believe me, just give it a try or just follow these techniques. When you're going to light a background, you're going to have light on the left and the right, as you can see in this diagram right here. You can use umbrellas to light the background, or you can use raw light. And you want to be sure, and you position them to be equal distance from the background, with both of them aimed sort of at the center of the background, where your subject's going to be standing in front of. And you also want to make sure that they are rotated or feathered away from the subject, so none of the light coming out of those background lights is going to hit your subject. To get that pure white background, you're going to want to set your background lights to be about one and a half to two stops brighter than the key light that's hitting your subject. And the easiest way to make this determination is to use a flash meter or do it like I do it, which is visually. So let's say, as an example, you've got lighting at F11 on your subject. You're going to want the background to be about F20 or F22 which is pretty close to two stops brighter. That ensures the white background. However, it should be noted that if you make the background too bright, more than two stops brighter than the light hitting the subject, you're going to get what's called wraparound. You're going to have light coming back and wrapping around your subject and basically doing what's called fogging your lens. Look at these two pictures. The image on the left is a perfect white background behind the subject but the image on the right has what we call wraparound. The light is starting to come around the subject and fog the lens. And you can kind of see it, part of her hair is a little blue, purple, and so on. And she is much brighter because that background light is really starting to light the front of her as well. And this is because the background is set to be more than two stops brighter than the subject. Here's another example 
where I did not need the background to be perfect. And the reason is the client went in using Photoshop and cut the person out from the background and placed them on a white background in their image editing and their page layout software. You can see at the top here, that's the top of my seamless background and even part of the ceiling. In the studio here, shooting this beauty and glamour shot, the background lights are set at two stops brighter than the subject. And then a little bit of Photoshop work really brightens everything up, creating that high key look. One way that can help you get that background just the right amount of white is to use your camera's histogram. The white background, for example, does not need any detail in it. And our histograms usually are used to make sure that we're maintaining detail in the areas that are most important. But here, we don't need to do that. We want no detail in that background, if at all possible, but again, not so bright that we get wraparound on the subject. If you look at this picture where the background is white and then look at the histogram, you can see on the very right side, some of the data is up against the wall. These show each of the different channels, but this is what you want. You want them to hit the wall. This tells you that you're going to have a white background or it's going to be extremely close to being one without compromising the subject. The subject is all that data that you see in the middle. The right side is that white background. So again, I'll reiterate what I've already mentioned. You do not want your subject to be so close to the background that when you light it to be two stops brighter, it starts wrapping around the subject and basically fogging them. You lose your shadows and you start getting color shifts and that sort of thing. So get your subject far enough away from the background that the light that is bouncing off the white background is not hitting your subject. Then make your background two stop brighter than the subject. Okay, so here's a photo shoot I did of a family. They asked me to do some group shots. They asked me to do some couple shots, then some with their two kids together and their kids individually, and finally individual portraits of themselves. And here is the selection out of all the images I shot, which was quite a few, the eight images they picked that they then ordered prints from. This is the final family image right here. And you can see that everybody's posed real nice and they're pretty happy with, with that shot. Then we came over and we got them as a couple together and another pose of them together. Then the two kids, then an individual of mom and an individual of dad, the daughter and the son. So they're very happy with everything. We made some big prints. They're hanging them on their walls. And, and now I'll show you the setup, and then I'll show you the images I captured. OK, so you can see here the setup. And I took this with my iPhone very quickly before they arrived. And we're using a cove. And as you can see, the cove here has the uh, curved bottom on it where there's no seam. We call it a seamless cove, or cyclorama, psych for short where you can see that the uh, corner of the wall or where the wall meets the floor is an edge but it's curved and this is a nice way to shoot anything from people to products that doesn't show that seam and it makes knockout backgrounds a lot easier if you got to uh, go to white or that sort of thing so what we have here is the bean bag sitting in the middle of there and then on the left here you can see a huge light box i'm using an extra large light box i want a big giant light source coming in and leaving, or I should say, coming in and putting some nice, big, broad, soft light on them. Now, I'm also using two strobe lights. Here you can see one bounced off the wall, and this is going to act as a fill light kind of behind them, sort of a back edge light is going to bounce into them a little bit. And then here on the right side, I have another light bounced off the wall. It's very difficult to get your lights all the way over there when you have a psych. So you've got to sort of use those walls to bounce and create your fill light and your edge lights and that sort of thing. You can also put a light up on a boom. In the case of this one, because it's on a knockout background, I don't use hair lights very often. So that gives you an idea of the setup here. OK, so now I'm in Bridge, just to give you an idea of the images that we shot and a little bit of the story of the evolution behind these. OK, look at this picture right here. 
Notice how the daughter, as soon as we're ready to take pictures, she's just hugging on to mom very, very tightly. And she's not comfortable with the shoot yet and the situation. And I'm going to start working with her and joking with her and playing around and saying, hey, do this, hey, do that, and that sort of thing. And also, as you can see, mom's head is casting a shadow. So I need to move that large light box closer to the camera. Okay, the other thing is, this is the way the psych is made up. He's got a vinyl floor that he uses for portraits to kind of try to keep from marking the floor up too much. Uh, by the way, the story behind the pictures is I was out of town, uh, went to another town for this family portrait session, and I just used another photographer's studio to set this up. He had the bean bag, which was perfect, as well as this vinyl flooring. And then uh, I basically just uh, went in there, set up, for this portrait session. You're also seeing my light stand here. I, it needed to be in the picture so that I could get the bounce that I want. And it's kind of creating a little bit of an edge on the back of these guys that's very soft. Unlike a hair light or an edge light that's aimed at a subject, you, it's much more difficult to aim and get it perfect on all the subjects. So by doing a bounce, you can get a nice edge along there that hits everybody. Okay, so if we're back over here looking at the pictures, you can see the pre-processed ones and then also the final ones are mixed in there uh, waiting to uh, be upsized to the um, print format that they're going to want. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down here a little further. You can see the daughter was still clinging to mom, but then I asked her to sit up a little bit straighter. Okay, so let's keep going down. Here is a JPEG of the almost finished process. Now we've got the daughter sitting up a little better and the shadow has gone from dad's face and I've got the son leaning but he's got his elbow on dad and that is just perfect. Now in there I wasn't paying attention. Mom stuck her hand under dad's leg and her hand is right there. Not in the best spot. So in the final image I go in and I retouch that out. The fingers. Okay as we go down a little further Let's find another pose that's a little bit different. You'll notice that I have mom tip her head a little more. I have dad tip his head towards mom. So they tip towards each other. Kids are pretty much the same. I'm very happy with their position. All right, then we mixed it up a little bit and we went to this pose. Here we've got mom and dad shoulder to shoulder and the kids switched places. And again, I like this pose. They didn't really pick this one, but that's okay. So I like it a lot. One of the things is the key light needs to be brought closer to the camera again to keep the side of dad from going too dark here. But at the same time, I don't have a lot of room to move that. So I have dad turn his head to the, to the left or his right or my left a little bit more. And I'll see if I can find one of those. Here he's turned a little bit more. Then we got mom and dad kind of getting a little cozier again, a little closer to each other and uh, we're getting a little shadow problem again so I've got to be careful there so that's pretty much that family portrait okay then we moved on to the couples and here's the very beginning mom's leaning towards the husband and that's all fine but then I had her turn her head towards the camera and it's a lot more powerful now this is the processed image and there's the raw file, or I'm sorry, yeah, there's the raw file, and uh, she's turned more to the camera, and that's a little bit better of a head pose than this. Okay, let's go down a little further, see what else, okay, she went back to that head turned a little bit too much, I don't really like that that much. Okay, the other thing that's gotten kind of weird is look at mom's feet. That's, that doesn't work so well for me, that knees up. So, what I ended up doing was have her put her knees together and extend her feet out a little bit more and that worked pretty good. All right, we'll zip down. Then we switch positions again to this here working and I think this is okay. I don't like this big long line. So we switch to this. This is much more relaxed, much more comfortable. And then there's the image they picked that we ended up processing and making prints. Okay, then we're on to the the two kids sitting together and Here's what happens when you, why you need to work with kids. They don't know how to pose and they do things like that. So you need to be very careful. And her head went up just like that only for one, actually two frames before I caught it and I had her bring her head back down. Okay. And then I, she, I had her tip her head towards her brother and that creates an even stronger, almost a bond between the two of them type approach. Or I should say, pose. Okay, then uh, let's see. 
the son had his arms crossed. Uh, that looks too executive-like, so I had him relax a little bit and lean on his arm for a couple. Okay, we also faced them towards the camera. I didn't like vertical. I went right back to the horizontal. They didn't pick any of these, so I didn't process them. Now, here we go again. Notice how she's getting kind of crazy with her head and his chin's up. You got to keep an eye on them and make sure that they keep those chins down. This is the one that I edited and sent to them. I think in the end, I'm not real fond of this because, you know, she's sinking into a hole here. It doesn't appear to be that comfortable of a pose. Okay, then we went on to mom. Now, this is, uh, this is a pose, this is her first natural pose before I start working with her. And she's looking very tenuous. She's looking at me like, uh, are you going to take my picture? <laughs> so you got to work with them. So I end up having her turn her head a little bit more and getting a little bit more into the, looking into the camera, which then means that she's given me permission, so to speak, to photograph her. Okay, I zoomed back for a few. Stool's a little too tall for her feet, so we didn't end up picking one of those. And then we rotated her a little bit. I didn't really like that I cut off the hands. I preferred this one a little bit better. Okay, then I get up high. I always believe in getting up high, getting down low when you're working with people and you've got the time. You get your exercise for sure, going down on a knee, then coming back up, uh, and so on. But this one I really like a lot. I love that that tilt of the head. It shows a softness, a vulnerability, and I think that works really well. With the same tilt of the head, I then go to the chin up a little bit more. Okay, and I think that works really, really well. In the end, I think that she picked, eh, let's see, which one? This was one of the final images that we that I ended up processing. Not completely done, but I gave it five stars and worked with it a little bit. And then we continued uh, going more of a profile pose before she turned her head towards the camera and then I got a little bit higher. That one was pretty strong. All right, let's zip down. Now, I messed around with this just for my own looking up, looking down. I didn't present any of these to her because my idea was more for something that I might use for my portfolio. All right, let's move on down to the kids. Okay, she wanted to be on a stool. She wanted to wear this dress with a leather jacket. And I really believe that it's so important to let the kids be who they want to be and how they see themselves to some degree. Not always having to be perfect in how they dress and so on. And it makes them feel good about the portrait session and so on. I will state my piece of and, and tell them if I think this is going to be a big mistake. But again, this is for them. This is not for me. I'm going to only guide them to some degree. So as you look here at the different poses, this is the one she liked the best. But we also did this, leaning back on the chair, head up a little straighter. Then, uh, oh, then she wanted to do this, I'm really tough or I'm a strong woman type of pose, but none of that really got picked. Straight to the camera, I kind of like this, but they didn't end up picking one, so I haven't processed that. And a few more here. Okay, then we moved on to dad. Straight on to dad, then zooming in a little bit. Okay, dad is a lot, works a lot better with the um, arms crossed type of a pose. So we did that. Here's the finished image that, that he picked, a higher angle than straight on camera, kind of looking down, arms crossed, no smile, was his choice. That's how he saw himself. I got down low, shot straight to him. I liked the head tilt, but we also mixed that up a little bit. I went with uh, more of a side profile looking at the camera. This worked better with him than it did with mom, but uh, didn't pick that one. His hand on the stool with his thumb in his pocket. Here, I think, also is a pretty good look. So, let's see what else we did. Leaning on the stool more towards the camera. So, as you can see, I shot a lot of material and gave them the option to pick what they want for the amount of prints that they wanted to order. And you can I showed you previously what they did. And finally, we're looking at sun. Now, again, this is typical. Let them do what they want to do before you start moving them into more suitable positions. I mean, this is the young, uh, barely teenager, tough guy look, and that's what he wanted to do. Then I started working with him, hands on his legs, 
and he wanted to wear this blazer with jeans and a tank top. Okay, no problem if that's what you want to do. These pictures are for you, buddy. So anyway, a little bit on the stool, a little bit more like this, looking up like he's a philosopher, profile. And again, I starred the ones that I really liked, but in the end, he liked this one with his jacket over his shoulder. So that's the final image that he picked with a big smile. Now we've got the teenager happy smiley face after he wanted to do all his sort of toughness. And again, like I said, I let him do it and then I start manipulating them and moving them and posing them and that sort of thing. So anyway, that gives you an idea of a family portrait session in a studio using a psych and one giant light source with some bounce lights for lighting. But if you close your eyes